Hello all and welcome to another episode of Your One Black Friend. I'm your hostess, Jolie, or you can call me Joe. Let's start the show. I have taken one week off of social media. For those of you who follow me on Instagram and TikTok, you noticed I haven't been as active. In the meantime, I've been painting. I realized, taking a step back, I've only completed two paintings this year. Whereas last year when I was off social media, I was completing about two to three paintings per month. I realized just how much of a time suck these things actually are. And I've been asking myself over the past week, is the sacrifice worth the payoff? As I was scrolling through social media, I said to myself, what paintings will not exist because you're doing this? What paintings will not come into this reality because you're doing this? And having that thought made me stop, put my phone down and go and paint. The reason why I'm telling you guys all of this is because I want to inspire you. I know that we feel as though these things are necessary, but despite the promises that have been made to us about social media, I think that there's a lot more benefit from interacting with people in the world out there than in this little screen. I feel like one day we're going to look back on cell phones and how much time we wasted on these things the same way we look back at people in the 50s and the 60s and how they chain smoked or like in the 40s or the 30s and how they gave opium and coke to children. There's always something, right? There's always something that society is doing that's terrible for them, but people don't realize it after the fact. What is being left uncreated every moment I spend doing this? What is not coming into this reality through my hands because I am lost in this. You guys know I love books. I tend to listen to books as I paint. Because I wasn't painting, I wasn't listening. So I went from reading four or five books a week. I mean, it's not hard. If you're spending eight hours a day painting and you're listening to, let's say, a five-hour book or an eight-hour book at 2x or 3x speed, you can see how easily you can go through books. It's basically the same thing as if you're listening to a podcast, except that books are much more in-depth. Whatever information, for example, gets discussed in this episode, if I decided to turn it to a book, a one hour long episode would turn into, let's say like a 200 page book with a lot more references and a lot more build up, a lot more streamlined. So that's one of the things that I love about books versus podcasts is because of the fact that it's just a more efficient way to learn or depending on your mindset to remember what we already know. I've talked about how we don't really learn anything, right? We just remember what we already know. If you are saying that you're learning, then you're operating from the assumption or the mindset that this is our first go. And for those of you who've been listening regularly, we know this is not our first go. And for those of you who are, this is your first episode listening, I would strongly encourage you to listen to past episodes because it's going to get more and more sort of complex. And I actually realized that the other day, I was like, man, like the deeper we get into this, like less and less people are going to be able to really understand what's being discussed. And I think I'm okay with that. I always know when a video is about to get viral because all of a sudden you get like a bunch of comments from people who have no idea who you are or what you're talking about and they're totally missing the point. And the other day, as one of my videos was going viral, I had this thought like, I don't actually want to appeal to the masses. <laughs> like I really actually like the very small group of people that comment, that understand what I'm talking about, that have been sort of listening the whole time, listen to the podcast. I like that because now you're talking to an audience that understands you as opposed to just like anybody off the street, which is basically what, what social media is, right? It's like you're just standing, you know, in a street corner talking, orating, and then anybody can just walk up to you and just be like, what the fuck are you talking about? As opposed to like giving a lecture in a class where people know who you are, which I think is what happens when you have the podcast or if it's just much more nuanced where a video isn't viral and it's only being shown to like certain people. I much prefer that. Another thing that's worth thinking about is obviously where are you performing? I saw a video that talked about how there was this guy who played a $3 million violin on the street, like in the subway. And he, I think he made like $30 because people that were just walking down the street, they didn't recognize like the greatness. Like they just, it was the wrong audience, right? As opposed to being part of an orchestra where people are spending lots of money and they're getting dressed up and they're coming to you because they understand the value that the mind of the audience is tuned to what you have to say. And of course, it's better for both parties. All right. It's better for those who understand that kind of music to go to such a place as like an Opry to listen, as opposed to having to go to a subway to try to like find the classically trained violinist 
And it's also great for the classically trained violinist to play to an audience that appreciates his music. And that was what has been sort of plan going in my mind. Like the more and more I'm on social media, the less and less I want to be on social media. And I really want to scale it down to just one clip a week, just to sort of remind you guys that the podcast is here because it's such a marketplace that just anybody can come up and well, very few people actually understand what's being said. And so I want to talk to the people who understand what's being said. You know what I mean? It's just much more rewarding to focus on that. I want to talk about the books that I've read this week and give you the lists in case you guys want to listen as well. Um, I Am That by Osho. I've read it before, but it was worth listening to again. Uh, Osho is one of my favorite thinkers and philosophers. If you've not heard him or heard of him or you've only heard rumors about him, I suggest that you check out his work anyway and just judge for yourself. Once again, when you see like his quotes in a par- public forum, you go and you read the comments and people are, some people are just like, oh, he had a bunch of like Rolls Royce or whatever. And he called himself a guru, but he believed in luxury cars. And it's like, once again, here's, you know, <laughs> somebody in the crowd who has no idea what they're talking about because they have that mindset that tells you that they're not gonna actually go and listen to what this man had to say. Right, because if they actually took the time to listen and really understand, notice I said understand and I'm pointing to my chest for those of you who are not watching, I'm not pointing to my head, to really understand what he was trying to say, if they really understood what they were, what he was saying, they wouldn't make the comment about the kind of car that he chose to drive. What does it matter? Who fucking cares at the end of the day? Right, regardless of his reputation, I've gotten a lot of knowledge and information from his work. Second book, once again, a reread. I've mentioned it. I mentioned it in my own book. I've mentioned it here and there throughout the podcast and clips. One of my favorite reads, Neville Goddard, and it's uh, The Complete Reader, which is just basically a collection of all of his talks together. Just worth revisiting. You see how calm I am, (laughs) by the way? Like I'm listening to myself talk and I'm like, yo, like I sound super chill because I've spent like a week off social media and just like in like listening to like some really great minds and just creating art. I'm saying, man, this piece is priceless, right? So next one was recommended by Sydney. Shout out to Sydney. Um, Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. It's funny because somebody had told me when I posted some clips from Neville Goddard, somebody had messaged me and said that I'd be careful because Napoleon Hill is classified as a con man. And the brief sort of reading I did on him was that a lot of the principles that he wrote about in his book were stolen from other minds. And what I said in response was, well, if you steal gold from somebody else or from another person's bank, um, it's still gold. (laughs) So so I'm going to take the information. And it was gold. I, I don't particularly care about whether or not he was a con man. He's not alive now. Um, and that book in particular, I found very, very rewarding, particularly in approach approaches to failure, which is what we're going to delve into in a bit here. Um, I reread the Kabbalion. You guys always, I always mentioned the Kabbalion, right? Hermetic principles, alchemy. And then right after that, I read hermetic philosophy and creative alchemy. That book is just more of a, like a glossary. If you want just sort of an understanding of hermetic like terms, I would recommend that, but it wasn't like teaching you the way the Kabbalion was. It was just more of like, here's some esoteric knowledge. Here's some bits about the Gnostics, you know, um, natal charts, what the sun means, the different gods, the sun, the other. So if you want a sort of a book to have that as a reference, I'd recommend that, but it wasn't like as hearty and as meaty as I would have liked it to be, but I I obviously kept the book. And right now I'm finishing Discourses and Selected Writings by Epictetus. And it's once again, it's along the lines of Stoicism and it's just the way it's written. Um, Yeah, it's just a kick in the ass. It just puts things into perspective. So if you guys wanna try or check those out, um, those are good reads, I definitely recommend them. So what I wanna talk about today though is failure. Failure, failure, failure. If at first you don't succeed, fail, fail again. If at first you don't succeed, fail, fail again. I had somebody talk to me and they were talking about how like, um, I gave them a tour of my studio and they're like, you have so much work. Are you just hoarding your paintings? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I've sold some of my paintings. I'm giving some away. Um, the issue I've been running into is that a lot of galleries are telling me that my work is too ethnic. And 
So I stopped trying to find a gallery for a while. I found one earlier this year. And then the lady was like trying to get me to pay to be a part of her gallery, which is not how galleries work because you're supposed to pay me after you sell my art. That's how that works. So I backtracked. But what happened after that is I allowed myself to get discouraged. Not that I quit. I just took a step back and I kind of listened. I had several gallery owners tell me that my work was too ethnic, which is so weird. It's such a weird thing to say, right? Because these are, I'm painting people and ethnic people are like, everyone's in an ethnic group, right? So I, I was left with this idea, with this thought that, well, if these were all like, let's say blonde haired, you know, blue eyed women, pale skinned women, would I have gotten that same comment? Of course not, of course not. But it's a weird thing to say, especially to a person of color. And so I took it to heart and I kind of allowed it to sort of discourage me. And I was like, all right, well, I'll just focus on other things, focus on the book. Maybe that's also part of the reason why I had kind of eased off on painting as well, because I was accumulating all these paintings. But then when they said that to me, I thought like, what I said back in response to them was actually, you know what happened? This is my fault. The reason why I've not gotten where I want to go with my galleries or with showing at galleries, the right galleries, right? Um, Cause like I said, it's not like I've had not I haven't had opportunities. It's been the wrong opportunities, not what I want specifically. So I took a step back. I took temporary no's as a permanent sort of like a failure. And I'm being strong with the word permanent, obviously not. Like I didn't give up painting. I'm still painting, I'm still a painter, right? But I did allow what, was supposed to be a temporary no, what is a temporary no to dictate my actions. I'm being very honest, guys. You guys know me, right? I'm always going to be straightforward and honest with you guys and about how things ha- are and how I feel about things. And it wasn't until reading Outwitting the Devil, and I don't care what your religious background is, I'm not even 100% sure if Napoleon Hill believed in an actual devil, and I don't think it matters, but it is a great read. Um, I don't believe in an actual devil, but it was a very good uh, at putting things in perspective. And part of what it talked about was, well, a lot of the time when you fail, you take a temporary failure, a temporary setback, and you, you're you the one who crystallizes that temporary setback into making it permanent by giving up. And so when the person was asking me about, you know, why am I hanging on to all my paintings? My response was like, because I took temporary setbacks and I made them permanent. And I called them failures. So by me stopping, it was my actions of stopping that made them permanent. Obviously, like inspired by that mindset, was fully inspired by outwitting the devil by Napoleon Hill. You're gonna fail. If at first you don't succeed, fail, fail again. You're gonna fail. You wanna fail yourself to success. There is nobody, there is nobody, there are no humans in this reality that have not had any failures. And there's certainly no successful people who have not failed exceptionally. And so I don't understand why we operate with this mindset that whatever, I just dyed my hair, I look like a character from Dragon Balls. <laughs> so I got distracted. What was happening? Anyway, I'll style it at some point. I just, I don't care. It was very important for me to, you guys don't care, who cares? Uh, it was very important for me to record this episode. So that's why I didn't, like, I didn't do anything. Anyway, sidebar. Um, <laughs> right. So exceptional failures. Every single person, every single person that you know or you consider a success were exceptional failures. Every single person that you know, and I know I just did this, and this is just an okay sign. I'm not throwing up some weird, like, Every time you do something, people think something. I, I'm literally just talking with my hands. Here, so for those of you who are watching and are looking for <gasps> Illuminati, <I'm> not. <laughs> I just, you gotta be really careful these days. I'm gonna get back on task, by the way, but you gotta be really careful these days. Like people are just looking for reasons to just like say things, you know? But that's part of it, isn't it? And this part of it. Anyway, go back to what I was saying. Exceptional failures. So why do you operate with the mindset that you're not gonna fail? It's part of it. After reading this book, I kind of sat back and I was like, okay, cool. So uh, let's go, like, let's fucking go. Like I had a couple of things I had to do this week, a couple of meetings. And I was like, normally I'd go into the situation 
like expecting and hoping for success. And instead I threw away hope and I was just like, this is just something that you have to do. You don't necessarily know if this will be a yes, if this is gonna go your way. It doesn't matter, right? Just go in and do what you need to do, right? You don't need to go into a situation like I'm going to, like I hope this works and this better works and this like I'm putting my whole heart and soul into this and I hope all this, it just goes my way. Why? Just, just go in and get it done. There's lots of L's on the path to success. And so any situation that you are going, you're encountering your, like any sort of endeavor that you're taking, at the end of the day, success is your end goal, correct? That's fine, but understand that you're not gonna just get up and go, okay, I want to be successful, and then the next step is success, right? It's going to be failure, 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 failure. So you might as well just go in and understand that you've got to pay your dues and L's in order for you to win. And I took that mindset on. <laughs> and I, like I said, I had this, I had this meeting and, um, and I was like going in under normal circumstances, I would be going in hype. Like, oh my gosh, like I'm going to like, you know, like power of positive thinking kind of thing. Um, I'm going to kill this. I'm going to be like, this is going to go the way I want to go. I'm going to like, and just hyping myself up. And I decided to try a different route. Nothing wrong with the power of positive thinking. Absolutely believe in positive thinking. In fact, I firmly believe what's better than positive thinking is positive redirection in the sense of if you catch your mind being negative, you redirect it to something positive. Like I think that's better. Um, but in this particular situation, I didn't go in expecting to fail, but I went in with no expectations. I just went in and did what I was supposed to do with the understanding that if it goes the way I want it to go, cool. But then there's probably going to be another sort of like adversity that I'll have to face on my way to where I'm trying to go. If it doesn't go the way I was supposed to, I want it to go, then that's okay too. Because at the end of the day, that's just an L, right? I've paid. Like imagine every loss you take on your way to success as payment for that inevitable success. If you kind of can move in that way, if you can maintain that mindset, how does your life change? Like seriously, how do things like all of us, how do things dramatically change for you? You're going to a job interview. You know, at the end of the day, because you have a desire for a job, you're going to get the job, but it's probably not going to be that first interview. It's probably not going to be the second interview. It's this economy, it's probably not going to be the 10th interview, but you don't go in with like, just feeling like sad, like shit, like this is a waste of my time, but you also don't go in like, okay, like this is it because that's how you hype yourself up. And then if it doesn't go the way you want it to go, then you get discouraged. You just go in like, maybe I will get this job on the first go. Statistically speaking though, nine times out of 10, when you're starting something new, it's not usually the first attempt that is successful. I've talked about this before. It bears repeating. So you go in and you take it as a learning experience because everything in this reality is absolutely a learning experience. So you go in and you take it as a, as a learning experience, but you also look at it as I'm paying my dues on my path to success. And then you don't let anything beyond that point change your perception of I will get to where I'm going. This is just the nose on the way to the inevitable yes, right? So like I said, in the last week's episode, I was talking about how when you give, you know, the kids the chocolate and you tell them to wait for five minutes, a lot of kids, you know, have a hard time waiting. And what I talked about was, yes, it's hard to wait if you don't trust that inevitably that five minutes is going to come. It's even harder because unlike the kids, those like <laughs> that they know that they're going to get something in five minutes, you don't know when success is going to come. You don't know when, what success is going to look like or from what path it's going to come at you. But that doesn't mean it's not going to come. The only way success doesn't come is if you crystallize a no into a failure. If you crystallize an L into a failure. In the book, Outwitting the Devil, he talked about that. He was like, not many people will keep going. Most people stop. And it's a normal reaction, right? If things, if you're wanting something <laughs> and it's not going the way you want it to go, the most natural normal, there's nothing wrong with you. The most natural normal reaction, if you want something and it's not going the way you want it to go, is like you try and it's not going, you try and you not go, is for you to stop. The next normal reaction is for you to try something different. My third suggestion is if at the end of the day, you just want success, then a third thing to do, a third thing to try is 
you put your eggs in a bunch of different baskets so that regardless of what you're in, one of them has to take you to success, right? Then you're not hyper-focused on it's gotta be this thing, right? Because sometimes that gets sort of like, like tempting or distracting. For example, use my cousin as an analogy, he wants to be independently wealthy. He wants his time to be his own. And so he figured that the best way to do that is by trading, by learning how to trade. But what I try to remind him was what his ultimate goal was. And his ultimate goal was he's not suppo- he's not trying to be a successful trader. He's trying to be financially independent. And so a trader or being a trader was just one path towards an end goal of success. And that's what I kept trying to remind him. I was like, if you're not careful, if you're not mindful, the game will have you distracted and make you focus on the wrong thing. So you'll get caught up in being a really good trader instead of being independently like wealthy and free. Do you see what I mean there? You see what's going on there? Sometimes it's really, really easy to slip and forget ultimately what your goal is. It's the same thing even like with social media. I've gotten caught up in social media. My end goal was success, right? But for a while, that big goal of, I just wanna be successful. I just wanna be successful. Anyway, that (laughs) that end goal of, I just wanna be successful, somehow turned into, I want to garner a lot of like followers or subscribers on social media and I'm off my path. It's like, no, 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 I wanna be successful. And there's different paths to success, whether it be art, whether it be social media, whether it be writing, whether it be podcasting, whether it be investing, whether it be t-shirt designs or fashion. I'm doing all of these things. They're all different paths. And the end goal is success. It's not a successful musician. It's not a successful, it's success and what that looks like and having an improved quality of life. And most importantly, most importantly, enjoying what I'm doing and how I'm spending my time on the path to success. Cause that's another distraction when I'm on social media and it's consuming so much of my time. The question has come up, Joe, do you actually enjoy this? Because even if let's just say that this is the path that's going to take you to success, Instagram and TikTok, if you're not enjoying it, then that the, the journey, you know, they always say it's not the destination, it's the journey. So if you're not enjoying that journey, then that's not the right path. It's a waste of time. We only get a certain amount of time, max on average, max a hundred years on average 75. If you sit back and you look at your life and you go, okay, I wanna be successful. And then you ask yourself, okay, how, what path am I gonna take to success? And then you decide, okay, the path that I'm gonna take to success, I'm going to spend like money. I'm going to spend 25 years doing something I don't enjoy. By the time you get to a place where you consider yourself successful, you would have spent 25 years being miserable. Success is ubiquitous. I'm gonna say this three times. Success is ubiquitous. Success is ubiquitous. Success is ubiquitous. How do you define it? It doesn't have to be how society defines it. You have to define it for yourself. But success is there, right? What are you willing to spend? How are you willing to spend your life? Because I've said in past episodes, your life and your time is the most valuable resource that you can ever have, hands down, okay? You can print more money, you can't print more life, and you cannot print for yourself a healthy body. So every day that you're healthy and you're happy and you can see and you can walk and you're not in pain, how are you spending that? Because if you're spending a day that you're healthy and happy and whole, doing something that you don't enjoy, you are wasting your time that you cannot print more of. You are wasting your time that you cannot get back. If I spend $20, I'll get $20 back. If I spend 20 years, 20 of my best years where I'm looking (laughs) good, right? And I'm feeling good and I'm spry and I can run and I can do, I can dance and I can taste and all the stuff like that. That's how I'm spending it, doing shit that I don't like. Yes, of course, you can make the argument that we reincarnate and we come back, but 
this is one path, this is one goal that we do remember at one given time. Because no matter how much you've spun this up, and no matter how much deja vu you have, and no matter how many prophetic dreams that you've had at the end of the day, we are really contained in this one life at a time. So you only live one life at a time and you only remember full on one life at a time. So how are you going to spend that? How are you going to enjoy that? If success is your end goal, make sure that the years of your life that you're spending to attain that are worth it. And if it doesn't feel good, don't do it. If it's a waste of your time, find a different path. I'm not saying it's not like, like you taking, because you taking L's doing something like you really enjoy, that's not a waste of your time. So for example, painting, I really enjoy painting, but some days I'm like, I start trying to paint something and it looks like shit. That's an L, just so you know, that's part of the process, but that's you taking L's on a path to eventually the painting doesn't end up looking the way I want it to look, right? If it didn't, if it doesn't eventually end up looking the way I want it to look, I would never have started it in the first place. Outcome, for those of you who read my book, you're familiar with this, right? Desire and outcome are linked. You would not seek something had you not already found it. All of timing's happening right now. So there's a correlation between a desire for something or a want for something and your attainment of it. But if you desire something, the key is to not stop until you attain that, however path that looks like. This could apply also to like a partner. Right, if you're looking for like in a romantic situation in your mind, you have something of the kind of partner that you want, right? You only miss out on that partner if you settle for somebody that's not what you want, right? The reason why you have a desire in your mind of the kind of person that you want is because on some level, now there is a version of you in what we call the future that will meet that person. Otherwise you wouldn't have had the desire for them in the first place. So just like those kids, right? That we talked about the example with the chocolates having to wait five minutes, remove the five minutes because you don't know when it's going to happen and just trust simply that you have the desire for something. I'm not saying for someone because I get a lot of messages from people telling me that they're going to marry me specifically. No, you're not. <laughs> like it's not, I'm not interested. I apologize, but thank you. I don't, I, I never know how to respond to that because like, they're very like, it's, you know, you could tell that they've been reading like the secret or whatever. And they just like, I've set my intention and it's you. And it's like, no, 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 it's not me specifically. There's something about me that you find attractive, but there's 8 billion people. There are other people who have similar traits like me go and find them. It's not me specifically. I'm spoken for. I apologize <laughs> if you're one of those people. I don't know how else to say it, but I'm okay. I'm good. Uh, but there's obviously something about me and the qualities that I have that you're looking for. But that doesn't mean that if you believe strongly enough and you put a picture of me on the vision board that I'm going to be yours because that's not, this is why a lot of people fail. You keep in your mind, as long as you keep the, the image open and the qualities are what you're looking for. Somebody healthy, somebody happy, somebody wise, somebody who enjoys music, somebody who loves art, respects the spirit world and thinks with his heart. Sorry. <laughs> I just like dry quoting um, India Ari's Ready for Love. That's a beautiful song, by the way. Um, but yeah, I should go listen to that song. India Ari, A-R-I-E. She wrote the song called Ready for Love. And it's a beautiful song. Um, but those are the qualities, right? So then keep your mind on, I want a person with these qualities, not that person specifically. Because I think that's also why we kind of get like thrown off course is that we get sort of hypo-focused on a person so that if it's not working out, we go, oh no, like we're, we're never, it's not, we're never going to be happy. We're not going to, you know, we're never going to find what we're looking for if it's not working out with that specific person that happens to have the traits that you want. No, no, no. There's 8 billion people. You will find the person that has the traits that you want. And maybe that person was one of those people that had the traits that you want, right? Just keep on going. Don't crystallize a failure by quitting. Don't crystallize a failure by stopping when you're that close to actualizing and realizing what you want. Sidestep, had a conversation, shout out to Rick, about alien abductions possibly, or just temporarily sort of logging off. And I just wanted to share this because I just thought it was interesting. So quick aside, and then we'll get back to topic. But it was like two weeks ago on a Tuesday, I got a message 
um, for my friend Rick, and he was saying like he was driving and he drives um, for a living and he drives the same route. And he looks, he looked away from the clock for like a second, looked back and time had jumped ahead, like a significant amount of time. And then he just kind of felt out of it. Like it was weird. I think it was only like five minutes, but still significant enough for you for five minutes to feel like a second. And it was very weird. And it was like an intense like time glitch. And that was on a Tuesday. And I was like, that's really weird. And I, my conclusion was either like a lot of this stuff like happens a lot where we leave. And by we, I mean like our consciousness exits the game and then comes back. And then we're kind of like, oh, what the fuck just happened? And I suspect that probably happens a lot more than we realize. We just tend to like ignore it because I've had similar experiences before, but I know that they don't stick out in my memory as much because I've downplayed it. And that's what I told him. I said, either that or you got abducted by aliens. <laughs> um, I'm not laughing because it's funny because every book that I've read on like alien abductions also talks about like there's issues with time. Um, especially when people are driving like that. So they clearly, whatever we call aliens are able to bend time, right? So the fourth dimensional beings, right? Because the fourth dimension is temporal, it's like space time. Um, so to me, that tells me that they are able to sort of mess with time, maybe pull it tight, spread it, or just put us in, like take us out of the game and put us back in. Maybe not at the exact moment that they took us out, but enough for some part of us to know that something's off, you know? And then the third suggestion I made was, well, maybe it's us. Maybe we are the aliens in a sense. By we, I mean people who are conscious within the game, what I call, you know, gods, right? Really the non-NPCs in the, uh, in the simulation. Maybe we are the fourth dimensional beings and every once in a while we, we log out. And what might have been five minutes in this reality may have been like five hours outside of this dimension. And then we just pop back in. And of course the game does its thing. So there's a temporary sort of, moment of like wait what the fuck and that's what he's reporting and i was like i wouldn't be freaked out either way because it is what it is like there's nothing that you can really do about it and freaking out about it isn't really going to change the situation and then thursday <laughs> no was it thursday three days later was on a friday i had the exact same thing happen to me i wasn't as like on it about like the time but i remember i was driving and i've done the same drive over and over again and I remember looking at the clock, it was like 11, like it was like 11, no, I'm sorry, it was 12.50. And then I missed my turn. It was like blacked, I, I blacked out. And when I came to, it was like 12.55. So the same five minutes. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> what just happened? Cause what? And it was, and he just had the same experience. My friend Rick just had the same experience on a Tuesday. And so we're three days apart. Yeah, we're having very similar experience. And what I when I talked to him about it, he was like, well, it may have been a Friday for you and a Tuesday for me, but at the end of the day, if all of time is happening right now, then it was all now in the present. And I was like, that's fucking brilliant. And I need to talk about that on the podcast and share that idea with you guys, because that's true. If all of time is happening right now and space time is like a blanket or a map, right? And I, let's say I'm an alien, and I'm abducting people. I'm ab if I'm abducting people from now, right? Then whether I take them out of now, and that now is a Friday for me or a Tuesday for Rick within the game, that's still now. So at any point in time, if there was a mass abduction, this is assuming that it was aliens and they were not the, you know, the actual fourth dimensional beings who are consciously choosing to exit the game at that point in time and take care of whatever we need to. But let's just say that there was a mass abduction and it happened now. That now could have been experienced across all of space time, including in the 1600s or in the year 3200. If all of time is now and we only experience time in a linear fashion, then whether or not something happened on a Tuesday or on Friday is irrelevant because it could all simultaneously be happening now. I want you guys to really sit with that because that was fun to think about. It was one of those things where like you hear it and you're just like, that's true. And yet I've never thought about it like that before. And what are the implications of it on a grand scale? What is really happening? So I wanted to share that with you. Um, 
Next point, I wanna talk about minding your own business. <laughs> right, um, this is a thought that I had a couple of days ago about caring about what people think. You guys have heard this. Stop thinking about what other people think, right? Run out of fucks, don't give a fuck, this, that, and the other. But I really want you guys to sit with what that means. A lot of us are crippled, inhibited by what we think other people are gonna think about us. So we won't do something, we won't say something, we won't move in a certain way, we won't whatever. We won't live our lives in a particular way because we're afraid what will people think. And if you think about how S, like how empty a thought really is and how like intangible a thought really is. A thought is a ghost. It's a ghost form. You can't hear a person's thought, not unless they, says it, they say it out of their mouth. And if they do, okay, so you said some shit to me. You can't hurt me with your words unless I decide that what you have to say about me hurts. Like I have to allow that to happen. If a robot walks by me and says, you're stupid. <laughs> Like, would I allow it to hurt my feelings? It's a robot. Obviously, somebody programmed it to say that, right? We had really say to think about it. Oh, does that matter? Did it have a thought? I, I need you guys to really sit with that. Really sit with that. Let's go back. Thoughts. You cannot, this is another quote from my book, right? You cannot think your thoughts before you think them, All right? So then that means that we're not responsible for our own thoughts. They just pop into our head. There's another quote. What you think is thinking isn't thinking. You're just listening to a voice in your head talk shit. You're not thinking. You're sitting. Try it when you meditate, right? I've been meditating also for the last couple of weeks. And I just watch. Like, it's sitting here. I'm, I'm repeating my mantra. And all of a sudden, here's a thought. And here's another thought. And then here's another thought. You're not thinking. They're coming into your head. That's why they're called intrusive thoughts, right? So you're, you're at peace. This is you here. And this is, I am that is worth the read. By Osho, he talks about this, right? So here you are, mess, you know, minding your own business, la la la. And then here comes a thought. And then another thought. You're not thinking them because you don't know what they're going to say to you before they pop into your head. So they're just sort of entering into your mind. And a lot of people are identified with thinking and identified with thoughts that they just sort of go with it and they accept it as their own. But it's not. I don't remember if I mentioned this in last week's episode or not, but I talked about. Actually, I did mention it, but bears repeating. If most people are not, if no one, <laughs> if no one is generating their own thoughts, all right, then why are you concerned about what other people are thinking? I'll say that again. If literally you can, like, you don't know what you're going to think next, which means that the person that you're worried about what they think about you, they don't know what they're going to think next. A thought is this sort of like mirage of a thing. And so you're living your entire life because you don't want a particular thought to pop into the mind of somebody who is kind of helpless and can't control what pops into their mind. Do you understand how wild that is? How restrictive that is? How insane that is? That we live our lives out of fear of things that people can't even generate consciously if they wanted to. Wild, absolutely wild. I was listening to Kanye over the last few days, I think. And there was a there was a line in one of his songs where he says, they say that I'm out of control. I'm not out of control. I'm just not in their control. And I really like that. Another line was, he said, I'm living in the future. So the present is the past. And then he says, my presence is a present. Kiss my ass, which I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, those two two quotes loosely tie back into what I'm talking about with like living your life the way, like in accordance with people's thoughts, the thoughts that they can't even control, let alone generate on their own will. Like most people don't even have will over themselves, like any kind of like semblance of self-control. We're coming close to the end of 2023. And then in a few months, people are going to generate their New Year's resolutions again. And they're going to start at the beginning and then they're going to fail. But they won't keep like failing to success. They'll just fail a couple of times and then let go of whatever the resolutions are. They cannot control themselves. Most people cannot control themselves, let alone their thoughts. And it's not that we can generate our own thoughts, right? But they can't, they can't even shift their minds away from that thought. So what the fuck does that have to do with how you're living your life? You get the 75 to 100 years if you're lucky because there's no guarantee that we're all going to make it to 75. 
and you're busy living your life in a particular way because you fear thoughts. What? (laughs) To go back to Kanye, at the end of the day, all the things that he said, I've not really been keeping up with like the saga that is his life. But from the last time I remember, he made some comments that were, well, anti-Semitic. And I think I've talked about this on the podcast. And that's obviously not okay, especially in the present climate of what's going on. You know, to briefly talk about what's happening in the Middle East. At the end of the day, regardless of what the people in charge of these countries are doing, the citizens are largely innocent. And that is something that we need to remember that even though we are programmed to see, for example, the Palestinians in one particular way, and it's been drilled into our heads, and we know how we are programmed to see them since 9-11, and probably before that, in our media, in our movies, in our TV, these are still human beings. And the children that are being killed are still children. They don't deserve to suffer in that way, to die in that way. And that's important to note that regardless of what's going on or where you stand, these are human beings who have the same 75 to 100 years if they're lucky. And being in a situation like that, a lot of people aren't going to even make it to 75. And a lot of people are going to live either in intense fear in the meantime or die in terrible ways, in ways that we in the West are lucky enough to not have to experience. And that's worth noting. So anything that can be done in a way that stops that so that collectively we're not suffering because we are all one. So even if it's something that's affecting people in a particular region, there's no way that it doesn't affect the collective on some level. And that's something we need to sort that out. We need to sort out. I don't know what the solution is, but I do know that if enough people come together and say, no, then people in charge of both factions or both sides will really, well, they would have to stand down. But in the meantime, until that happens, we need to see each other as humans and as part of a collective, regardless of the skin that they're in or the religion that they profess to believe in. But that's, that's my take on that. To go back to Kanye, regardless of the comments that he's made, at the end of the day, he's still relatively more free than a lot of people because the big thing that you've noticed is he actively goes out of his way to not care, to to show. Or, and I, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say to show because he doesn't strike me as the kind of person at this point in his life where he's trying to demonstrate anything. This man is just doing what he feels like doing and saying what he feels like saying. And that's a certain level of freedom that a lot of us, the rest of us, don't, can only really like aspire towards for being real. I saw a video of him getting a pedicure and this woman clipped his toenail too short, Kanye. And you watched him like look at the lady as she cut his toenail and hurt and he goes, ow. And then he was like, you know what? That's it, this is over, like I'm done. And he gets up. And I don't remember what rapper was filming him, but the rapper was like shocked, which is interesting to me because like at that level of like fame and wealth, you would think that he would understand, right? Like he should be free as well. You think he would understand where Kanye was coming from. And Kanye said something like, it's my toes. And I thought about how if I were in that situation and somebody clipped my toenails, clearly she's not there, like her mind's somewhere else and she's just hurt me. Would I do that? (laughs) Prior to seeing that video, probably not. I think I would just be like, ow, that hurt. And then I would be like a little upset. And then I would kind of be super tense and kind of hoping um, that she doesn't do it again. I don't think I would remove myself from the situation because of being polite. We're supposed to be polite, which is just another way of controlling us. It keeps us from standing up for ourselves or speaking out for ourselves. And for him to be like, it's my toes and I'm going to end this now. I find that just very fascinating. And I took that in. I wish a lot more of us moved in that way. We're honest and say like in setting clear boundaries. Because 
I remember something to the effect. I think somebody said like Paula Abdul had like she was getting a pedicure and her toe or foot got like really infected. And then I think I saw another comment where people were saying like somebody lost their foot. <laughs> I, I'm not laughing at this. At, at, I'm laughing at the situation, not like at the person's pain, but they lost their foot because something similar happened. And I thought, gosh, like imagine the person got nicked and they didn't say anything because they didn't want to be rude, even though they've just been hurt. And then they ended up losing their foot because they didn't want to be rude. And I remember I I'm thinking like, gosh, how much of our actions are driven by, once again, other people's perceptions. I'm not going to do this thing that's better for me because I don't want this person to think this. Most people don't think. Most people have thoughts interjected into their brain. So you might as well do what best serves you. You get what I mean? And that's something I've been kind of going back and forth with, with the podcast, with social media. I'm still going to do the podcast because um, I read a lot and I want to be able to share what I have to say, you know, what I've read rather with you guys. And like I said, I kind of like it smaller. It's the Instagram and the TikTok thing that I'm going like, do I really need to be doing this? And I've gotten a lot of different people's inputs and I'm still moving in a particular way where it's like, well, I should maybe just do this continuously once a week. But the more I think about it, the more I'm like, I don't fucking want to. (laughs) I don't want to. It's just whether or not it's once a week, that's still editing. And that's still time that I'm doing something that's taken away from me doing something else. And it's not quitting because at the end of the day, I'm a painter and I'm a podcaster. I like talking. I like sharing ideas in this way, in the form that is most comfortable to me. Because my issue isn't social media. Clearly, you could argue that YouTube is a kind of social media. My issue is short form. It's always been my issue. Like I'm contributing to people like diminished attention span. Because you're going to go and you're going to watch my my one minute video. And then you're going to scroll to another one minute video. And then at the 10 second, you're not going to just be like, oh, I've just watched Joe's video and then I'm off. So every time I'm contributing to that, like I'm part of the problem, whether or not I'm only editing one video a week, the moment I put that on there, you're going to go into the app. I'm contributing to that. And that's something I've really got to sit with. Sorry, I'm guys, I'm just like venting. (laughs) But I hope that you can take something from this as well, because I know you I know I'm looking right at you. I'm looking in your soul. I know you're presently doing something that you don't want to be doing because other people are saying that, well, maybe you should do this, but it's not something that you're feeling. And it's something that there's other ways to spend your time. I hope that liberates you. That should be enough. It's your time. Like Kanye said, it's my toes. Because like I said, I think it was 2 chains that was filming him and he looked shocked because he couldn't understand why Kanye would be like, I'm done. Because the idea is, well, you've started something, you got to see it like through, right? And even if it upsets her, she's going to make her feel, but she's just hurt him. It's not about her feelings. It's not about her thoughts. It's not about her, what, whatever her, her like, I'm sure he's going to tip her, but at the end of the day, it's about protecting his autonomy, setting a boundary and also making sure that his body is, is safe. Are you doing that in terms of your mind? And are you doing, are you that protective of your mind, of your time, of your body? Another situation is like you go into like, well, you're like, let's say like you're, you're trying to eat healthy and you get around certain family members and they want you to eat like all of this stuff. A big one for me was when I gave up drinking and I would be around people and they'd be like, well, you should drink, you should drink. And I'm like, I don't drink. And then they would try to like peer pressure, just have a drink. It's my body. I'm sorry me not wanting to put poison in my body is making you feel uncomfortable, but you're making me feel uncomfortable by insisting that I put some shit in my body that I don't want to put in my body. It's my body. Now the pressure, you can succumb to that and be like, well, fine, I'll just have a drink. But how's that serving you? You're hurting yourself because you don't want other people to think a certain way about you fuck their thoughts. Like they can't even like generate that thought. These thoughts that are coming into their head are being generated by society. It's a re, it's like a loop. Yeah. Like if we lived in a society, for example, where drinking was not as normal, then those thoughts that popped into their head wouldn't have popped into their heads. Those are automated thoughts. 
if you're a free enough individual to take a step back and go, I don't want to imbibe an alcohol and harm my body in that way. And you're saying that to people who are not free and they're drinking because that's just what you do. Your freedom will be offensive to somebody who's enslaved. And so they're saying, put a chain back on you. And you're saying, I don't want their chain. And then they say, but you should because everybody else is in chain or in chains rather, but it's your life. It's your freedom. No, there's something very powerful there if you can kind of let it marinate and then like affect your behavior. Anyway, I want you guys to think about that. Not a bad episode. Catch you guys next week. Thanks for watching.